Thank you to the last panel. Uh, very interesting discussion. Thank you for your homage to Andrea, and thank you, Patrick Jenkins, for moderating. So now, last but not least, of course, we come to our final session, a conversation between President Lagarde and Chair Andrea. I give the floor to the President. Thank you very much, Connie, and uh, good, good afternoon to you, Andrea. I think a test of your um, fame, popularity, and success is actually the room. Not everybody can see it because a lot of people are watching from online and the room is full, which is quite staggering after a day and a half of all this hard work and great debate. Because you came, of course. No, rubbish. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> ah, nice. <laughs> Witty and thinking of you on your feet as well. So you've been showered with compliments uh, like hardly anybody I have seen, uh, even upon leaving. And I'm going to ask you some really quick questions and you're going to have to respond quickly as well. So, what is your best memory? My best memory of these five years? Um, I would say the start, the, the, the start in town halls. Uh, I mean, meeting with the staff, listening to them, understanding what uh, was that was working well and what maybe needed to be changed. Okay, what's your worst memory? Worst memory. Uh, well, I mean, we all have bad memories of the uh, of the pandemic, of course. But I would say honestly that the most tense period has been the the spring this year. I mean, uh, now everybody has been saying, "Oh, you know, uh, how well the European banks have done, how good we have been." Let's be honest. I mean, we have, we have been very scared about what was happening this spring. And, uh, and uh, uh, when you see deposits flowing out of the banks, I mean, as a supervisor, you start really freaking out. And uh, so that, that, was, uh, that was tough. <laughs> what was your most difficult decision? Well, in these five years, uh, of course, the, the decision on, on uh, dividends has been very difficult uh, and, and, uh, and painful, no? because, of course, uh, what I would have liked uh, was that the banks themselves had uh, uh, decided to show some restraint and refrain from you know, uh, paying, uh, distributing dividends and, uh, and doing buybacks in a moment in which uh, there was such a radical uncertainty on what was coming. No? I mean, we had a, an unprecedented shock. We are seeing projections uh, of GDP uh, negative growth of 14, 15 percent. So, I mean, uh, and still, you know, uh, while uh, moral suasion seems to work in national environment, uh, you know, European uh, Union is still a rules-based type of uh, community. So if you don't come with a hammer of a recommendation, things don't happen. So uh, that was a difficult decision. But uh, I, I think that uh, uh, although some, some people also in this room, I know, disagrees, uh, I, I, I still think it was a good decision. So did you have to come down with a hammer? We did, yes. <laughs> we had to come with a recommendation. How did you use the hammer? Well, I mean, it was simply the, the uh, basically a recommendation. I mean, agreeing on a recommendation, deciding, issuing, and uh, and uh, and this uh, this delivery. And I remember honestly, let's say you know you don't like to use the I, I don't like to use this uh, hard power. Mm -hmm. I would have liked much more the soft power of you know banks seeing the value in doing that. Um, <clears throat> but eventually, I remember that day there was. Uh, a respected observer of, uh, you know, banking issues that uh, tweeted, no, uh, ECB uh, recommendation not to distribute, all banks say yes, sir. Uh, EOPA says uh, uh, insurance companies, uh, you should not pay dividends, and uh, insurance companies also from yeah. na some national authorities, insure paid dividends yeah. in several countries, not all countries, but in some countries. So that conveyed, in my view, and it's not a criticism of Europe, of course, that did a very good job in pushing that. Petra is not in the room, it's okay. But anyway, I mean, uh, the, the point was that, you know, that was a very visual, uh, you know, re representation that the banking union was there and delivering, you know, and... and so uh, the banks did not disappoint you at that moment? No, no. 
Well, disappointing me because they didn't follow moral suasion. I would have liked that. But anyway, eventually, of course, when we came with the recommendation, they did what, what they were asked to do. Those who know you well would argue that at that point in time, it was a test of your decisiveness and you lived up to the test. Would you agree? Yes, I, mean, I, I must say I remember very well when I, when I, when I started, let's say, the, the last phase in, in 2011 no, uh, of, uh, of uh, um, this work in supervision, no, when I became, became chair of the EBA, I remember uh, the, uh, the interview with Michel Barnier no, uh, when he was selecting me. First of all, it was one of the most difficult interviews ever because the evening before I was, I was told that Michel Barnier didn't want to do the, the interview in English. So I said, <laughs> I said, can you do the interview in French? I said, oh my God, I, I cannot. So that was a bit of a, but eventually we managed. Uh, but when, when he came out, he said, you know, you, you will have to be very strong in this. You will have to show decision. You will have to show, you know, uh, uh, spine. And, uh, and, and it was, you know, tested very, very, very early on, and I learned it's uh, it's difficult, but uh, as also Sam was saying, in this in this job, uh, you need it, and uh, and uh, so I'm I'm glad that you say it. I think that uh, you know I don't shy away when you need to take different no, decision. No, absolutely. Take us inside the the boardroom when when that was on your mind and you decided that it was the right way to go, given that moral suasion was not working. What was it like? Well, All right, uh, board members are shaking here. The, the, no, no, the, the boardroom, we have to remember ourselves, was my, you know, my, my uh, room at home because we were all working remotely. At oh, no fear, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> um, uh, no, but I, I would, uh, uh, let's say, I think uh, uh, the, the process was first, uh, let's say, all the discussion individually with the bankers and then with the European Banking Federation uh, that organized the meeting with the banks that didn't go as, as I expected. But then I, I discussed bilaterally with most members and then we had a meeting and eventually, I mean, I, there were different views around the table, but I think, and I was discussing with the board this uh, in, the, in, our, in our last meeting, um, I think that, uh, uh, let's say, we have been very good at coming at consensus. Also, when we don't have agreement, when there has been a, such a good quality of discussion amongst us that eventually everybody can live with something that uh, is seen as having strength. No? Uh, mm. So the decision was not difficult. I mean, I had some difficult discussion with some individual members. Some of them will remember it, but, uh, but eventually the decision was not difficult. So what tools did you have that you wish you would have used? Not necessarily in this particular instance, but in general. You have a toolbox, you have used many of them. Are there tools that you wish you had used a bit more? And are there tools that you wish you had had, but you didn't have? I'm thinking about Claudia, who is going to take over from you. So she, she also will appreciate the advice. I mean, the, the remark I was making before on moral suasion is an important one. Mm. Uh, I mean, we, we lack this tool. Uh, so so uh, we do have it uh, with individual banks. So the, 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 our supervisory teams, when they engage with individual banks, they have leverage and they can convince the bank to do things. And sometimes the bank is not convinced, but still sees the, <laughs> the, 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 the benefit in doing it nonetheless. Um, uh, but w when you talk to the industry, to the sector, sometimes it's difficult because I understand that uh, uh, that's the point in which you are a, a, a banking union, at least on the supervisory side, but you don't have uh, the, the, the government side uh, no, uh, also uh, in, in the room to some extent. No? And that, that can be an element of, uh, and the type of, uh, you know, uh, environment at the national level means that uh, people feel more obliged to follow you know, what, the super, what the supervisor says because, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a community. Here, banks uh, bring us to the European Court of Justice without uh, a blink of an eye. Mm. I mean, uh, in national situations, uh, this doesn't happen very frequently. Mm. The, 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 the bank feels a bit uh, reluctant no, to challenge in court the supervisor. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a difference. Mm. And we have to learn to live with that. I mean, that's the environment. So what's your track record before the European Court of Justice? 
Well, uh, Frank maybe would be a better place to reply. We lost several, uh, several uh, judgments. Uh, and uh, I think that, uh, and Frank says this, and I, I'm totally 100% with him, uh, bring them on. I mean, eventually, if the banks are right, if the court says that they are right, okay, we'll learn and we'll adapt the way in which we behave. But I don't think that we should shy away from taking difficult decisions because we are afraid of losing yeah. in court. So see you in court is fine. See you in court is fine. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, well, it's true to, true to character. That's good. Um, so what, what tools do you wish you really had had and you don't have in the toolbox? Uh, to, to be honest with you, it's not uh, that... Uh, and that, everybody else. Huh? I mean, it's not that we have two... I, I don't think we are lacking tools. I think the okay. tools that we have in our funding regulations are the right tools. Um, the key problem, I think, uh, and this is what is making me, me um, a bit upset, honestly, on the discussion, for instance, now on crisis management, you know, is that sometimes we have the tools, but uh, uh, because of the... Um, concerns at the political level from the legislators when the regulations are made, we try to put all the possible constraints to the authorities to not enable them to use their tools with sufficient amount of discretion. So for instance, when we take uh, deposit guarantees, no, I mean, yeah. I'm not talking EDs, not talking EDs, we have yeah. done enough yeah. of that. But let's say with the current amount of funds that we have in the European Union is in the same ballpark of what the FDIC has in the US. Right. Same ball. If you take but it is scattered fund, all over. It's scattered all yeah. over, but single resolution fund yeah. plus national deposit guarantee schemes, same amount of funds. Right. The problem is that uh, because of, uh, you know, different, uh, uh, I mean, uh, willingness to preserve national specificities in the way in which you use these deposit guarantee schemes, or fear of activating too much a single resolution fund, which is the only mutualized part of our safety net, we put so many constraints that whenever we have a crisis coming, I mean, we cannot touch basically a single euro of this, of this, uh, of this funding, and we have also, so this means that we have very, very short time frames now to try to find a solution to this, uh, to this crisis. And honestly, that's something which is difficult. And we have an excellent co co collaboration with the, with the SRB. We prepare together, we work together, and so far we have delivered. But again, I mean, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, I mean, sometimes these concerns, no, uh, that everybody wants to preserve the national uh, uh, bells and whistles makes our life more difficult. We have to activate 21 different legal systems when a bank goes into a crisis. And honestly, it's, I mean, we had the crisis of Sberbank, plain yeah, vanilla, yeah, no? Yeah. A bank that went bust just because it was Russian after the invasion of Ukraine. Yeah. But still, we had to, you know, find a way in Slovenia, where the bank was the fourth bank in the country, a way in Croatia, different way, where Hungary. the bank was the third bank in the country, different in Austria. I mean, it's not making our life easy. Yeah. So having a little bit more, you know, uh, these tools that we have, making them more available, easier to use, and trust the authorities. We set up these European authorities, the SRB, the ECB, trust the authorities instead of tying our hands in the legislation. Okay, so that's one of your wishes for the future, yes. that that can be fixed and addressed. Yeah, okay. Fingers Skeptical crossed. though. <laughs> what would you like your legacy to be? My legacy... Uh... You know, I, I think that uh, the, there are several things I'm attached to, but uh, the most important one, in my view, is breaking the silo culture inside the ECB and between the ECB and the national authorities. Mm -hmm. I think we have a, a fantastic firepower in terms of uh, technical skills, in terms of uh, people who really knows uh, the job, is passionate. So enabling these the pooling of these resources in our in our in the SSM across uh, uh, the whole uh, collective house we have and uh, uh, in, uh, give us much more effectiveness, much more impact. No, so we have started doing that. We, have, we are not yet finished with the job uh, internally. We did the organization. Uh, we have a, an integration agenda with the national authorities, but still a long way to go and we can be even better, but I think I'm proud I initiated this process. 
Uh, but I can say it. that's outside the interview because I'm not asking you to opine on that, is that the cooperation between the SSM part of the house and the central banking part of the house, not just through shared services, but in general, in terms of substance, intellect, sharing of data has been, uh, has been fantastic. And well, I would I mean, like to thank you for that. You have to let me speak a bit about that because you are deviating from the script that I thought you were following. So I don't. <laughs> for you all to know, he doesn't have my script because I just made it up. No. So basically, uh, the, the, uh, the first point I wanted to make actually was, act was stressing the point you made yesterday, which for me is very important. No? Because, uh, let's say again, sometimes, I mean, I'm old, uh, so uh, I've always been a strong believer in having supervision within the central bank. Yeah. And uh, actually, uh, I've seen in these years the value of having that. I mean, and again, if you, if you had asked me, as I was expecting you to ask me, <laughs> that uh, <laughs> uh, how we, we managed you know, this, this series of shocks, I think that what, we, what was fantastic is ex was exactly to tear down these, uh, these firewalls between the two sides of the central mm. bank to mobilize the extraordinary intelligence that we had in understanding the economic environment, how it was changing, getting the statistics we needed on the sectors uh, hit by COVID or by their invasion of Ukraine, uh, pulling together people, no? junior people also across, uh, across the house and making them work together and preparing you know, uh, spot-on analysis real time, yeah. people working in the nights, you remember that, yeah, yeah, no? yeah. also during the spring, that has been fantastic. And I think that uh, honestly, and this goes to, uh, your merit, Christine, I mean, could never happen if they didn't see this type of, you know, uh, uh, contact relationship uh, between, uh, between the two of us. And, and if it was not for, so for, for, for your leadership that I, I, I owe a lot to. Yeah, uh, much too kind. No, no. So, uh, looking back at all these years, uh, and not just the last five, but looking back, if you were to advise a young graduates in, you know, let's say sciences, anthropology, or economics. What, what, what advice would you give for his or her future? I, I do that quite a lot when I go. I have meetings, you know, with uh, young graduates in, in yeah. finance or with the student university when, when, I, when I go in my country visits sometimes. And uh, I mean, the simple thing I tell them is, well, consider becoming a supervisor because all these, uh, <laughs> these skills that you mentioned can be deployed very effectively in supervision, including anthropologists. Um, uh, and, and you know, it's, it's a job. I mean, I, I tell the people always, no, I mean, if you look at the payoff of being a supervisor, it's terrible, no? Because uh, if you do your work very well, nobody notices. And if you do a single tiny mistake, you are slaughtered no? in, yeah. the, in the streets. So, um, so people should really run away from a job like that, right? But instead, all the people that, uh, that start uh, making, entering this profession, eventually became, become so passionate about it. I mean, they, they and that's, that's fantastic. And you can deploy all these tools and, and come to know real life uh, challenges that you can see in, in, in few other professions. So I really try to, you know, use these arguments to get a little bit more in, in incoming uh, stuff in our, in our collective, uh, you know, uh, organization. You know, there was, uh, there was an, a few Netflix series, series that, that were instrumental to encourage young people to move in certain professions. You know, Formula One is an example, but there were a few others. Do you think we should encourage Netflix to look at <laughs> supervision? Uh, I mean, uh, why not? I mean, usually, uh, usually you know... Uh, Would you accept to star? No, no, that's not, uh, that's not something I would, uh, I would uh, uh, do well, honestly. I know my limits. That's true to character as well. No, you don't. So the time remaining for us, um, my dear friend, is an hour and 15 minutes. You okay with that? No. So we, I think we have to come to a close because lunch is next. Um, I know you're not going to take up yoga, but... What thing will you do wherever you go next, which you haven't had a chance to do so far? 
You and know. I'm not asking you whether you have any regret. That was on my little list of questions that I put for myself this morning. Because you clearly have no regrets. You know, I mean, I'm in the Guardian, there is this uh, column no, that is now uh, starting life after 60. You know, and you have all these very <laughs> inspiring stories of people that, uh, you know, after 60s change totally their yeah. life and yeah, uh, do well. something totally different. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint. I'm a boring person and I will... I mean, my, my main ambition is to continue doing the same boring work from a different place, maybe, but... Uh, <laughs> but Shall continue. we applaud this boring person that we like so much? Thank you. And by the way, I, I, I need to say it, I, uh, I mean, again, I, I, I thanked already a lot of people, but uh, I, I think I missed the two most important people uh, that uh, supported me in these, uh, in these, uh, in these five years, uh, four years for you, Christine, and, and three years for you, Frank. Uh, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, again, as, as we say several times, this is not an easy job, no? I mean, uh, and uh, you have a lot of people working with you, but eventually, you know, uh, they, when, 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 when you have to take the difficult decision, everybody say, OK, this is in your, <laughs> on your desk. No? So you, are, you, you feel lonely many times. And, and having the comfort of uh, coming uh, at any moment uh, to, to, to ask for your advice and having, and having Frank with his uh, support and friendship throughout these years, I mean, uh, I wouldn't have done it wi without you. So thank you very much to, to both of you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.